Uh, so I would like to make sure we have time for some discussion, some commentaries from the floor. And I'd like to invite all the speakers for this session to come up now with the chairs. Ollie, if you'd come up. I'm not going to do the formal in, uh, introductions. Uh, they can do so when they speak. Most of them are well known to you, all of you, and some of them have been involved in pilots. I like to make a few introductory remarks. For my sins, I've been involved in pilots for the last 20 years and was instrumental and participated in what was probably the first pilot associated with Yam in Namibia. But of course, it wasn't the first pilot that took place. And we have to go back to Manitoba. We have to go back to the basic, the negative income tax pilots in the United States and Canada. And in a list of uh, pilots that I drew up, in proposing for the leadership of the Labour Party in Britain this year, if Labour wins the next general election, as I'm hoping we will, because I'm an economic advisor to the Shadow Chancellor, John McDonald, then there is a firm commitment to do a series of pilots across Britain. And some of you may well be, well be aware that in Scotland, uh, the Scottish government has put aside £250,000 for preparatory work for pilots in four areas of Scotland. Now, this indicates, I think, a new phase in the legitimation of pilots, but at the same time we've had pilots in places like North Carolina, I called it the accidental pilot because it's the many years and which produced remarkable results. At the end of 16 years, it was found that the, on average, those children who'd been born around the time of the beginning, who had been recipients of the basic income payments, they're not ideal, they weren't quite what most of us would regard as perfect basic income payments, but they were pretty close. On average, those children were one year ahead in schooling compared with children in families that had not been receiving the basic income payment. That's a remarkable finding, and it's a finding that came from an accidental pilot. There's also been pilots in other places, and recently, the Netherlands, and we're about to hear from Oli Kangas, the famous Finland basic income, or it's called basic income, pilot. And we've had the Indian ones, about which all of you now should be familiar. And there are other pilots that are in design, the long, very long-term one in Kenya, and a number of other places where small-scale pilots are taking place. Obviously, there's a lot of controversy about pilots. We know those controversies. I've tried to address them in the appendix of my book on basic income and in this report that I've done for the Labour leadership. I genuinely believe they have positive value and are helping to legitimise a basic income. And recently, a very famous newspaper ran a story by a critic saying there is no evidence whatsoever that a basic income has short-term positive effects, medium-term positive effects, or long-term positive effects. And I got very angry. I get angry very easily, but I got very angry because whether you think any of the pilots are close to the ideal that many of us favor, they all are telling a consistent story. The findings are consistent in one direction. 
And the direction of all of those pilots has been positive in different ways. So that's the context in which we are now confronting, in a sense, a reassessment of where we stand with pilots today. Should we be doing more of them? Should the design be different? Should the methodology be different? Et cetera, et cetera. But we now have accumulated a remarkable amount of methodolo methodology, knowledge, empirical knowledge, theoretical knowledge, and intuition. And that's very important, the narrative that you gain from doing pilots. One of the things that we haven't emphasized, and maybe that somebody here would like to do a PhD thesis on the subject, is that in our Madhya Pradesh pilots, besides doing statistical surveys, at the beginning, in the middle, at the end, and then afterwards, a legacy survey, we also had a sort of anthropological approach where detailed case studies of a hundred people, a hundred families, was pursued throughout the, the project. We've done some analysis, but there's so much rich detail in those case studies that they genuinely would make a wonderful PhD for somebody who's anthropologically oriented. Okay, with those few remarks, let me introduce our first speaker, and it's his Oli Kankas. Oli, in my mind, is the architect of the Finland experiment, except, as I'm sure he will explain, it hasn't turned out quite like he meant it to turn out to be, and it's been a source of frustration. But I would like to begin by congratulating him on staying the course and having done a wonderful work. Holly, do you come to the floor? Thank you, Guy, for your nice words. Actually, I wanted to be an architect, and I plan to go for education to be an architect, but uh, I failed. And uh, I ended up to be a simple minded sociologist. Uh, and uh, to make that long story very short about the Finnish basic income experiment, there perhaps a um, couple of parts. The, fun, uh, the first part was inspiration, and the second part was desperation, and the final part was perhaps desperation. <laughs> In that sense that when we first began to plan the experiment, we were very, very eager and, and uh, thought that they were masters of the universe, we can do tricks. But then, very soon, we realized that the, the money uh, allocated to us was 20 millions, and you can't do rather many tricks on that sum of money. And then, on the other hand, very many proponents of basic income, they have accused us that uh, our experiment is not the proper basic income experiment, and actually it's not, uh, but it's an experiment with uh, employment effects. And the reason is that uh, uh, our plans, what we had and what we planned to do, they were very, very much circumscribed and uh, the government set conditions what to do, what, what should be inspect, and uh, very much the design that we had in the very beginning, we thought that our design is the best in the world, and then we ended up with having an uh, experiment with 2,000 unemployed persons and uh, experiment uh, lasting only the two years. But the good thing uh, in our experiment, I thought, I think, is that we have a uh, randomized experiment in that sense that we have nationwide uh, control group and nationwide uh, treatment group. And the idea is that if in the end of the experiment, we find differences between those two groups that in the beginning of the experiment they're totally identical, then we can draw causal uh, uh, reasoning and say that the basic income is causing uh, those differences. And uh, I will not go into detail of what we have found. We are evaluating the results on the basis of registers. We have amplitude of registers in Finland. I would say that the the Finnish registers are perhaps the best in the world. In that sense that you can link together 
on the basis of social security number, different type of registers, income register, employment register, educational register, uh, residency or social security, etc., etc., and you can link the relatives, family members, everything, and you can follow up those people uh, before the experiment, during the experiment, after the experiment, five years, ten years, fifty years, hundred years, whatever. So that uh, there are lots of possibilities to do that research-based studies. And then uh, we, are, we conducted our uh, survey, uh, and we wanted to somehow create in the minds of the people, in that sense that the register tell what has happened, that the registers don't tell and why it has happened, so that we wanted to have that terminological side uh, out by carrying out those uh, surveys that are targeted to the treatment group and control group equally, the same questions. And then we have face-to-face -face interviews just to keep, uh, go deeper in the minds of people and get, get their own feelings. So, uh, the First thing what opened up when we re uh, released our first results uh, half a year ago, and when I was telling the, about those results in front of the Finnish and international journalists, I said that I can guess and imagine what you are writing and how you are recording uh, on our, our results. And huge uh, headlines was. Failure in the Finnish basic income experiment. And uh, I was somehow anticipating that's the storyline how they are writing. That to my mind, there's nothing failure. In the case that you were expecting huge employment effects, in that sense, it's a failure. Basic income uh, didn't improve, at least didn't improve during the first year of the experiment uh, that much or significantly uh, employment rates among those who were getting basic income in comparison to those who were not getting basic income. So that the no, of our conclusion on the basis of registers is that no significant employment effects whatsoever. And then the opponents of basic income said that the uh, basic income is, is not good. And, and we can forget the whole thing. But uh, they forget to look at the different, the results from a different angle. In that sense, that those people who were getting basic income, they were not more lazy than those people who were in the present social security system. So that the proponents of basic income can say that they will see basic income is not detrimental for employment. And then, when it comes to the phenomenological side, uh, all uh, things that we have done so far so that basic income improves people's self-respect, improves the image of themselves, the trust in society, trust in politics, trust in politicians, trust in their own views on the possibilities, etc., etc. So that that's the positive side of the story. Okay, uh, what then will happen after the uh, experiment? Okay, the government is very. Uh, stuck in the discourse of employment and employment rates. And they are saying that uh, we will not implement basic income because it's not good for employment. And they once again forget those other results. Uh, and uh, the previous experiment was planned or, or uh, inaugurated by the center uh, right government that was replaced by left. Right, uh, left center government led by the Social Democrats. And that new government that uh, was uh, or took power two months ago, they said that they will have a new experiment. And they said in the uh, governmental program that uh, they will experiment with pay, uh, not with basic income but uh, with uh, negative income taxation. But it's not yet totally done in the way that the bureaucrats in the Ministry of Social Affairs and the bureaucrats in the Ministry of Finance, they are saying that perhaps it would be better to experiment and enlarge the, the basic income experiment that we had. And to my mind, it would be a good, good thing to uh, expand it from the scientific point of view to we would get better results in that sense that the, in that uh, pilot that we had, we had 
animal persons, and uh, if we will have continuation, there could be any kind of persons living in the room. And uh, then uh, the Finnish social security system is uh, rather complicated. We have a dual system in that sense that we have basic security uh, for those who are not uh, employed, who have no income. We have uh, basic unemployment benefit, basic uh, sickness benefit, basic re rehabilitation benefit, basic this and basic that. And uh, we have income related benefits that are totally income related in that sense that there are no ceilings. And it's totally income related. And then uh, the problem. But the good side in the Finnish social security system is that all kinds of social ills are very small, smallest perhaps uh, in the European Hemisphere and world, worldwide uh, when it comes to uh, income inequalities, child poverty, uh, social exclusion, etc. etc. But the problem is that uh, it, uh, we have very high marginal tax rates and therefore the government is very keen to see if basic income would somehow help the avoid those uh, tax problems. And also, the system is not transparent. It's very, very uh, complicated. And therefore, the government uh, said two years ago, a, re a research group to study possibilities to reform a basic social security system. And I had the possibility to be included in that group. And there, in that group, we somehow said different kind of possibilities, how to go further. And uh, I hope that the steps that the government will now take uh, on the on one hand, on the basis of the previous experiment and on the basis of the coming, uh, coming experiment, is that they unify those basic security benefits to one single benefit. In that sense, that they, they are rather at the same level that they apply different kind of decisions or definitions of household income, household composition, etc., etc., so that it's a mess, not only for the client who is circulating the, between the, those different benefits, but it's also a mess for, for very many bureaucrats. So that the, the next step, I would guess, would be to simplify the basic security schemes. And there we have two options. One option is to uh, somehow merge together those basic benefits and say that, uh, okay, there we have basic income or partial basic income that uh, replace, will replace those, those uh, basic benefits. And the uh, other option is, and uh, I think that perhaps the government that is led by the social democrats will uh, take an, another option. The social democrats ha has, have launched a social policy plan that has First, basic security, then uh, uh, somebody will get a little bit more in the case that the person is active and a little bit more if the person is even more active. So that there are three parts and on top of that there will be those uh, interplated benefits. And then uh, if the basic part of that is uh, universal basic income or is it means tested, we don't know yet. But it's good to know uh, that the Prime Minister and the leader of the Social Democratic Party he says that the basic part is a kind of social assistance or mimics social assistance. But it's good to know that in Finland the social assistance scheme is perhaps the more lenient in Europe and more liberal in Europe. In that sense that if you don't behave as the bureaucrat says, they will take 20% away from your benefit for a couple of weeks and if you much more don't behave properly, they will take 20 more percent. So that the, in the worst scenario, they will take something like 40 percent of your minimum benefit away. But that 60 percent that remains, it's warranted by, by uh, the constitution. So that the, that's a kind of basic income that we already have in the moon. And uh, therefore, I think that it would be very easy to try to launch basic income thinking, but the only problem that we have is a political disability and the politicians. But perhaps we can try to tackle that problem in a proper way, hopefully. <laughs>
We'll move straight on to the second uh, presentation uh, from Caroline Tetti from Give Directly in Kenya. And if she'd like to go to the floor now. Thanks. Thank you, Guy, and thank you, uh, the rest of the panelists, conference participants. I don't have the gift of the height, but I have the gift of the voice. So don't worry, you will hear me. Uh, my name is Caroline Tetti. I work with Give Directly as Director of External Relations and also Field Director uh, in the launching of the Basic Income uh, Pilot in Kenya. Um, I think I have a moment of my life having the opportunity to meet Ollis, because when we were planning the basic income pilot in Kenya, I was always referencing Finland and monitoring how his experiment was going and how they were progressing as we were starting off Kenya. So Ollis, just to know, we learned so much from your work and we got inspired out of that. Um, So um, the basic income pilot in Kenya, just as a brief, is a randomized control trial that is targeting about 195 villages, all poor and rural, and um, currently we are talking about 20,000 beneficiaries receiving $22 a month, uh, stratified in three different treatment groups. The first treatment group of 71 villages receiving a lump sum, second treatment group receiving $22 per year, I mean per month, for two years, and the third treatment group that is receiving $22 per month for 12 years. This for us, as Give Directly and as participants in the cash transfer space and basic income for that matter, is an opportunity for us to showcase what is happening with our basic income and cash transfers in a space where we don't have a lot of pilots. Apart from Namibia, Kenya is the next um, you know, pilot that we can refer to in Africa. We also take, um, you know, um, cognizance of the size of this experiment by virtue of the number of people it's meeting and, the, uh, you know, the period that it's going to take, uh, 12 years. That is really long and that's a very huge experiment. Um, one thing that we, I would also like to bring to our attention is, as a Kenyan, I feel like this is a very great opportunity for me to be able to engage in basic income from a different perspective in a world where people are thinking about the welfare state, automation, technological advancement, and not so much about basic income and its effects on poverty. Therefore, we're expecting that this experiment is going to give us an opportunity to relate basic income to poverty. This session is more about what do we do after pilots. Speaking to so many people in this conference and from the time we launched this program three years ago, I don't see anything different that we are listening. Everybody is very positive about basic income, like uh, basically the evidence is on the table for every case that you present. I therefore think that time is ticking, the clock is ticking, time is not on our side, and if I were a recipient of a basic income, the first question I'll be asking myself is, will my child have work tomorrow? Will my child have an income tomorrow? If not, then time is running out and we should be having a basic income that can be able to benefit my child also tomorrow. The evidence that we are seeing from Give Directly's program uh, are mainly anecdotal and qualitative, and that's basically from interviews with the recipients However, the good news is that we are expecting, um, you know, the next, the very first release of the results after the midterm assessment sometime next year in 2020. Otherwise, the information we have right now from the anecdotal evidence is that there is extremely positive impacts of this program, impacting people at a personal level, at a community level, and most of all, the empowerment, particularly of women, cannot be understated. We have seen a program in Kenya that has changed families, has changed relationships between women and men, has changed the attitude of governments towards their people, has changed the relationship between people and their government, and has brought peace in communities that previously were constantly at the doors of their government officials seeking for um, arbitration. 
When we are done with the pilot, which is now, it is time to make basic income a reality. And how do we do that? Basic income will not be a reality if we do not get people on the table who have the decision-making powers and those range from governments, range from politicians, range from donors. These people have to be on the table talking about basic income and the fact that time is running out. Today I listen to a lot of programs and think about 15 years I've spent implementing traditional programs funded by aid and basic income has convinced me more than ever before that I have spent a lot of my time doing the wrong thing. Because we have given people programs that are very personalistic, assuming to be the know-it-all, defining problems, diagnosing it to communities that we don't even understand, and proposing solutions and forcing it down their throat. That is not what poor communities in Africa are looking for. Poor communities in Africa are looking for an opportunity to be empowered, to, given a, to be given an opportunity to make a choice about their lives, to be given a chance to define their problems and define the solutions. And that is what basic income has given them, an opportunity to be true to themselves. We need to start after these pilots, conversations with bureaucrats, with political leaders, to move the second hand to the minute hand, to the hour hand, so that basic income becomes a reality. Because from where I come, basic income is in the realm of academia and NGOs. If it is to become a reality, it has to be part of a public policy, public discourse, and social policy. We also have to invest in building advocacy wider than it is right now for basic income to be known so that we can be able to um, you know, activate demand as well as the supply of basic income. We need to transform knowledge into reality. And knowledge can only be transformed into reality if the people who are supposed to be receiving the basic income understand it and ask for it actively. We cannot all speak for a billion people in the world. We have to give them an opportunity to speak for themselves through bottoms up advocacy. Top-down advocacy will help us deliver basic income from the hands of decision makers and give policymakers an opportunity to invest in the right things so that people's lives are changed in meaningful ways. Today I sit in this conference and when I look around, I see very little of Africa. After the pilots, we need to think about Africa. Where is Africa in the basic income debate? Are we going to run experiments in Africa and forget about them on the table of decision making? We need to build a basic income network for Africa and the time is now. It is not tomorrow. We need to see more of Africa because basic income is not just about automation, work, the welfare state. It's so much about poverty and the people who depend on aid. Think about tomorrow if America makes the decision to change their policy on social welfare into basic income, and they say that all the money they've been giving to aid is going to go into basic income for America. What is going to happen to Africa, where so much aid has been going? Think about the humanitarian sector. is increasing. There are more disasters. There's more insecurity. What is going to be the fate of those populations who live on poverty without crisis, who still need our help. This is the time for us to speak about Africa and the role of basic income in giving people dignity, choice, and empowerment. I am closing. As I can see, Guy is beckoning. My time is up. I hope we are together in this. The energy should continue and the banner for basic income should fly even higher. Thank you. Very nice. And Karen, we did at least have a, a 
Biang Congress in Cape Town. And I totally agree with you that Africa is a, a potentially fantastic place for basic income to become a reality. So thank you very much. The, the next the next speaker is, is Jenna Vandron, who's from the University of uh, British Columbia uh, in Canada. And I'd like to ask her to take the floor. So while we're getting those up, let me introduce myself. My name is Jenna Vandron, and I am um, a long-standing member on the board of directors of the Basic Income Canada Network. We're a nonprofit, and so in some ways, I have no business speaking about the Ontario pilot because we didn't run it. But I am an expert in what happens when you advocate persistently for about a decade for a national basic income now, as Caroline just said, and you end up waking up one day to find a provincial pilot that <laughs> um, is more of a negative income tax. And um, so we built the groundswell and, and really tried to advocate for a national basic income policy, but there certainly was appetite for more piloting. That's great. Thanks. Next slide. So. Just so we're all on the same page, I'll give you some quick um, details about the pilot. Uh, and if you click the next one, um, yeah, perfect. Okay, thanks. So um, it was in Ontario, which I've circled here for you, that pink province in the middle. Um, the pilot was intended to be for uh, people ages 18 to 64, partially because of pensions that are in place for people over age 64. Um, the benefit level was set at 75% of our low-income measure, not high enough. Um, that was just under $17,000 per year for a single person. And if you uh, were a person that had a registered disability, you could get an extra $500 a month. Still not enough. Um, it was a refundable tax credit model, a negative income tax, as I said. Um, and that had the advantages of being very similar to the way other social... Um, security programs are delivered in Canada, but of course is not a basic income pilot in, in the truest sense of the definition. It was intended to run for three years, with payments running for three years, more time after that for research analysis. Um, and this is probably not a spoiler alert for anybody in the audience, but it was actually cancelled last year abruptly. Just as quickly as we woke up to the news that there was going to be an Ontario pilot, we woke up to the news that the Ontario pilot was cancelled. Um, and to me, that's a huge act of violence. It was awful. Um, it was awful for me uh, as an advocate to wake up to realize that, and I can only imagine how awful it was for people who were receiving the basic income payment. Um, and that was 4,500 people, by the way, and 200 controls, and they were distributed across three sites in Ontario. So uh, the question I always get now is, why did the government cancel it? Next slide, please. Um, this is a picture that it won't be up for very long of Doug Ford, he's the Premier of Ontario. Um, and he was newly elected last summer when the basic income pilot was cancelled. He claimed that it was not working, that it was too expensive, and uh, was not sending the message that the government wanted about welfare and work. Um, they preferred true, more tried and true methods of income support and um, were advocating for welfare policy that was based on a welfare to work model. So, um, next slide, please. Yeah, that's great. Stop there for now. Um, so I, I would like to actually challenge that and say that, as many of you know, I believe very strongly that basic income works. And so what we did as the Basic Income Canada Network, upon realizing that the pilot was canceled, we, we did a lot, and so did a lot of other people. We did a lot of... Um, movement building and trying to petition the government to keep it going. The participants self-organized, created um, a class action lawsuit. There's been a lot of activity since then, but what I'll highlight now is the results of um, a scrappy little survey that we put together, doing the best that we could. Um, I mentioned we started a petition. So we petitioned the Ontario government to keep the pilot going, to start it back up. And um, from that petition, we got um, thousands and thousands of signatures, and of those thousands and thousands of signatures, over 1,000 of them were actually pilot project recipients themselves who signed our petition. And we know that because we had a little box that people could tick if they had received, a, um, if they had been part of the pilot. So uh, what we did after that was contact the people who had responded to the petition saying that they were members, uh, they had received the pilot um, project money and that they were participants. and. Um, we asked them some questions about self-reported uh, physical health, mental health, 
um, and community and social changes in their lives that happen since they received a basic income. So um, it's not perfect data. It's far from perfect data, but um, all the government was able to produce was a baseline report showing how impoverished people were and how destitute people were at the time that they started receiving a basic income. And we felt that that was not enough. So there was not enough time that passed for the government to analyze um, the first wave of follow-up results. And so we did this um, survey and we got 422 responses. People reported dramatic improvements in mental health. This was one of the most dramatic areas that people uh, self-reported improvements since they got a basic income. Over 88% uh, of participants had reported improves, um, improvements in their psychological distress. Uh, next, please. Physical health improved as well. So, for example, weight loss and weight gain, um, bringing people into better health with the ability to eat better. Nutrition was one of the things people cited as being the, um, another one of the more, more dramatic changes in their lives. Some people were able to reduce or eliminate medications for their mental and physical health conditions. Um, and people also reported having confidence and ability to plan for the future. Some people were able to visit friends and family that they hadn't seen in years. A significant number, next please, went back to school. Um, many in the baseline survey reported being in dead-end jobs. And many in our follow-up survey um, reported being able to keep jobs, um, get promotions, start or expand their own businesses, and do volunteer work. Some even paid down debt. But upon cancellation of the pilot project, many of these problems returned, and some even worse than they were before, because people had made commitments to schools and to rent that was more expensive than they could afford before, and on and on. So next slide, please. That brings me to some lessons learned. Um, I admittedly am much more cautious about um, piloting than I was before. I mentioned that we advocated for a national basic income policy, and that's still what we advocate for, not for pilots. But um, the pilot did legitimize public discussion, including through consultation. Um, and it showed that basic income was serious and feasible and a real policy proposition, not just a vague utopian idea. Um, and the Parliamentary Budget Office actually used the Ontario experiment to cost out what a basic income would look like for the rest of Canada. Um, on the administrative side, I think we learned some important lessons about um, transitions and um, as well as applications and how difficult actually the administration can be. Um, a key lesson for advocates and for the government as well, I think, was to the, uh, the extent to which people living in poverty, especially on social assistance, don't trust the government, rightly so. Uh, and, and this pilot, I think, perhaps gave them even more reason to be distrustful and are very anxious about change of any sort. Um, so some anti-poverty groups in the beginning were among the biggest skeptics before the pilot began, and I think that affected enrollment and was one of the reasons why it was a little bit slow in the beginning. Um, luckily, there was enough time the pilot lasted for long enough that most of the recipients are huge champions of basic income now, and many of the anti-poverty organizations and foundations um, got on board, and even if they weren't and still aren't on board with the concept of basic income, many of them were and are on board with um, continuing the pilot. So there was a lot of uh, outrage at the pilot being canceled, and politically, the, the cancellation of the pilot in some ways, I think, increased support for basic income. It was linked to um, a number of other cutbacks to health and education programs, that was made by the same provincial government that I discussed earlier. And so the decision really appeared ideological. It was a kind of a cross the board slashing. And I think there were, um, in some ways, a bit of bonding together of people who had um, seen cuts made in multiple social areas and uh, were displeased about all of them. So in some ways, we've been able to get a, a bit more of a groundswell, and there's been a lot of action since the pilot was canceled, and certainly a, a lot of negative press for the government. Um, but the experience for me, as I mentioned earlier, has raised the question of whether or not to pilot again, and whether evidence from this pilot would have been enough to win over emotion or, and, and ideology, um, and, and that I'm not sure about. So I'm going to take you back to the picture of Canada that I showed you earlier. Ontario is the pink one in the middle. Um, and I think one of our main things that we're going to be working on the rest of uh, the year, certainly, is focusing on the federal government, putting pressure federally. Because um, a basic income, in my opinion, is best delivered nationally. 
We have a federal election coming up in October, and we're trying to make this a key election issue and um, build the ground of support that I was talking about. We have um, 35 local groups in different municipalities across the country, and we're relying on these groups to get people out to the polls and to get them to ask uh, their local representatives about basic income. Um, and lastly, I want to end on a positive note, um, because I, I think that this basic income is now part of mainstream conversation, and that was not the case before in Canada. I remember on the subway <laughs> once, a couple of years ago, two years ago actually, when the Ontario pilot was just starting, I finally heard somebody mention basic income, and it wasn't me. <laughs> and I almost had a heart attack, like, wow, this is, this is a household word now. And um, we recently had a, a report from uh, the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in Canada, which was a big initiative that the federal government did, and they called for a basic income for all Canadians in their recommendation, and this is huge. Um, so, we are ending with a ground of support, and you next slide, please. Um, we invite you to join us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenna. Your enthusiasm is infectious, even in the middle of the afternoon. It's great. Um, and the next speaker is, is Samia, uh, who I've known for a long time, comes as a good friend, was a vital part of our, our pilots, and her only defect is, is that she works for the World Bank. But I, I forgive her that every, every time we meet. So I'd like to ask her to come to the floor. Thank you, thank you Guy, and um, I must tell you how I got involved with the basic income community yesterday. You heard Mr. Shiv Kumar speak, and he emailed me last night at 4 o'clock. He's coming back from the US, so he's clearly jet lagged. And he told me, I was so surprised to be, that you were invited to light the lamp. Are you a part of the basic income community now? I said, clearly. But, but the story is that um, every pilot requires a very good baseline. Now, our baseline firm really messed it up. So I was an economist who was working with the World Bank, and it was literally, you know, a, a guy and Renana Ben and Sarabhai telling me, why don't you come and fix the baseline? Because we need to start giving the money out, and we need the data in place before that. The ulterior motive was that guy promised me an unending supply of Swiss chocolates, which never came. And Sarabhai told me, he'll take me to the village that you just saw in the film, which never happened. But <laughs> my life's changed, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Next slide, please. Uh, so as you, most of you have heard, uh, the uh, Madhya Pradesh experiment actually took over 18 months. It was about 6,000 individuals. The key part is that in the, the, the money was not given at the household level. Every man got it, as the guy said, every woman got it, the elderly got it, the children got half the amount that was given to the, to the adults. Um, it was small. In fact, I was just having a conversation with a gentleman and he said, it was just 300 rupees, that's hardly anything. But the effects that we saw were large. It was 300 rupees for an adult and 150 rupees, uh, you know, for, for, which is just 25 cents, literally, uh, for, uh, per month for a child. It was unconditional and it was monthly. It went directly into the bank accounts. So compared with the control group, we compared the findings of the control group over three rounds of statistical surveys. We had a baseline, which I came in uh, last minute, and then there was a midline, and then there was an endline, and as I said, we had case studies as well. So in total, we generated data for about 12, very, very rich data for about 12,000 individuals. And it was the first time unconditional and universal cash transfers were being tested in India. I won't get into the results. The results are in the book. Um, but the first result that we uh, thought, was, which was very interesting, was which Sarah Price explains in the movie, is that we saw the large emancipatory effects. Here were people who just with 300 rupees, when they were pooling it all together in a household, were able to get out of the clutch of a money vendor, were able to return the debt, were able to buy buffalo and goats, as you saw, and probably start living. There was increase in food consumption. We collected food security data as well. We collected the data on the consumption basket. There was improvement in medical uh, treatments and conditions. So the elderly were not, probably they were delaying their medication, started having medicines immediately, as and when the money came in. They started having cataract operations. That was a big... Uh, big uh, improvement that we noticed in our, in our surveys. 
Uh, we also measured some of the traditional nutrition scores, which was uh, the wasting, the underweight, and uh, the, uh, the, the height for weight, uh, height for age score stunting. And we actually saw improvements, which were very shocking for us that within 18 months, the stunting didn't show as much, but wasting and underweight, children were eating more healthy stuff. They were able to buy eggs, they were buying uh, chicken, they were, they were eating pulses. Uh, so there was clearly an effect on child, child nutrition. We saw uh, an improvement, and so one of the one of the most usual effects is that you would try and put your child in a private school or uh, send her, uh, you know, just start sending her to school in the first place. But we even saw an improvement in attendance. So the kids who were actually engaged in child labor gave the child labor up, and uh, we were now going to schools. Um, there was an improvement. We also tested their academic scores, and there was an improvement in the academic scores as well, and of course, an improvement in household savings and the number of hours worked. So here we did not uh, see a decrease in labor effort, which is one of the most common criticisms of basic income that it would make pe uh, people indolent and lazy, and they would cut down on work. But of course, in, in the Indian experiment, we saw that there was an improvement uh, in the number of hours worked. Next, please. Uh, in terms of, so what I'll do is I'll quickly tell you what our techniques was and, and techniques were and then uh, go over, uh, you know, as a self-reflection on the kind, you know, whether we did it correctly and, you know, what may be the next steps for Violet Sedentia. It was a modified uh, randomized controlled trial. We basically selected our villages randomly. So within the village, we did not say this household and these individuals will get it and the others won't because we didn't want resentment. And it was not possible to control for all things within villages. Uh, the other uh, intervention we tested was, you know, that the pilot was implemented by SEVA. So we also divided our villages where SEVA, as a voice organization for women, was present. So that was an additional effect we tested, and it came out very strongly. So if basic income was combined with an organization that is working in the village, uh, is helping them uh, in terms of opening bank accounts, is guiding them, then the, then the effect became uh, much stronger. And it was a saturation approach. So, you know, one of the uh, other criticisms of basic income uh, experiments is that you cannot study community effects. But, but in this case, since the entire village was getting the basic income, as you just saw in the film, they were able to put the money together and start a fishing cooperative. So there were a lot of feedback effects uh, that came in, uh, in the tribal pilot in particular, the film that you saw. Uh, but since the experiment was donor funded, it was funded by UNICEF, we couldn't take, you know, uh, one criticism maybe, why did you just do six villages or 12 villages, you could have done more. But we were financially constrained. So the caveats that you normally, when you start writing and you start presenting this to the policy makers, one of the things that, uh, and Carl Wiedekist is here, he knows about these caveats, he's written in, a, in his excellent book, Guys, uh, Guy, and we of course discussed it in our book as well. One of the caveats is, oh, well, people will do exactly what, what you know, they think they should be doing so that they keep getting the money, which is called the Hawthorne effect. But we think we took care of it because, you know, we were not observing them day and night. We were not saying... You know, are you sending your kids to school and, you know, maybe I'm going to cut down on your money if you don't do this. And moreover, what we found was because the amounts were so small, they were sending, spending it on basic necessities like, you know, cataract operations and buying their children shoes. You saw that woman in the film was barefoot. So it was literally like buying a pair of slippers, etc. Now that couldn't be because, you know, she would want to please me as a researcher. Those were decisions that were taken, you know, which were probably basic. The, the other caveat is uh, what is called a street light effect. So I'm going to test things which are probably visible here because the light is better here. I can't test those things. We, but we didn't say that we would, you know, so a lot of the policy makers say, oh, so what about the bottom line question? You think that this is an affordable policy? We never set out to test that. We were in two minutes. So we didn't set out to set that. And um, we tried to answer them, but not necessarily in the, in the experiment, but overall fiscal calculations. And long term, you know, I mean, is it something as a, that the basic income policy is feasible for India? But having said that, no experiment can really answer that because you can't extrapolate the findings from 12, uh, 12 study start sites to the whole of India. But we said that this is, if it's working in the rural setting and if the money is going out there, it can potentially work. Next slide. 
What are the questions that are usually asked by policymakers? Which we, I mean, I'm just going to quickly skip over that in the presentations available later. But as I said, it's mostly the bottom line question. Oh, people will start drinking, then be a decline in labor effort. What I want to say on this slide is that the policymakers also need to be informed and made more aware of what are the kind of questions they should be asking. So if there is a decline in labor effort, what are people doing instead of that? If they're not doing agricultural labor and if they're in farming, that's the sort of question that we should say to policymakers. Why don't you ask us that? Because it's probably showing a shift in work in better, better sectors. So the reflections of the experiment is that UBI experiments are necessarily political, particularly in and a thriving democracy like India, and UBI is no small idea. So it takes time. But where we started in 2011 and 12, we've come a long way. We've heard a lot of experiments, although they are targeted to farmers in Telangana, in Orissa. But the fact is that they are taking off. The Congress Manifesto had a version of the UBI, so it's taking off. What we realized over the course of the experiment is that it's very important to communicate to us. So the importance of writing is very important. You know, I mean, our research reports are literally taken at face value. And the fact that a particular statement is absent means that you don't have a comment on it, which is not the case. Um, and then the importance of communication, which is engaging with the media and journalists, the importance of advocacy, which is donor commitment. In our case, our donor was a little hesitant. And then finally, the issue of measurement. How do you measure the total benefits, which is empowerment, emancipation, empowerment of women, reduction in labor, opening up of labor markets, etc.? How do you expand the debate on measurement going forward? Thank you. Thank you, Zanya. One of the great pleasures of working in a team is that afterwards uh, the different authors have a slightly different slant on the analysis and it's great because you do get different insights from different team members and I, even listening to Samia now, I've just learned a couple of things from our own project, so that's very good. The, the final speaker is Namun Lekang, who'd like to come forward. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Namun Kang. Member of Asian Income Korea Network. I will talk about Jungi uh, Youth Asian Income. Uh, it is paid to young persons of age 24, 1 million won per year. Uh, there are uh, the recipients uh, 150,000 persons, which is about 1.2 percent of Jungi population. It is the second largest basic income implemented after Alaska. It is paid in local currency, which means that the use basic income can only be used in small business stores with annual sales of less than one billion. In terms of labor market effect, Gyeonggi uh, uh, use basic income can measure income effect and multiplier effect. I will speak to uh, this. Yes. Uh, basic income um, is the, the uh, main characteristic is to combine basic income with local currency. It's an uh, economic strategy uh, so to maximize multiplier effect with the minimum cost. Because young persons have a consumption uh, propensity to consume uh, of almost the world. So it's also a political strategy to the maximum number of supporters, voters with minimal cost. So incorporate to incorporate small business owners into Beijing Income Alliance. And in four years, more than 600,000 young people will receive basic income. Yes. And after Gyeonggi Youth Basic Income, uh, uh, we are trying to uh, think how to nationalize basic income from here. Uh, there is no royal law growth. Uh, but the first strategy is to enlarge basic income alliance. 
The first is young persons. They are the protagonists of future politics, and new speech in country increase young persons' interest in politics. UBI can increase young persons' demand for common wealth dividends. They should think production function, not as a capital and labor, but also is a function of environment and common wealth. So, which kind of intergenerational justice to achieve? Young people bear the welfare cost of the population and age, and young people also bear the cost of land speculation. They should buy expensive houses from older generations. The second member will be farmers. In Korea, foreign farm direct payments are paid in proportion to the cultivating area, but the cultivating area is extremely unequal. After uh, uh, Governor Lee elected the uh, uh, governor of Gyeonggi province, farmers all over the nation begin began to demand farmers' basic income. So that means give us basic income, farmer. It is actually a participation income, but they like to call it basic income. Uh, farmers' basic income is showing signs of expansion uh, nationwide. Uh, Jeonnam province, Jeonggu, Gyeongnam, Chunam province decide, has decided to pay farmers' basic income. The only problem is the effect how to study farmers' basic income. The direction of farmers' basic income is uh, to pay in the form of basic income, as close to uh, as basic income. The same amount to the individual, not to farm or farm houses. And the third member will be small business owners. Local courage can only be used in small business as I said. Um, since they are originally conservative voters, if they change their mind, the vote difference will be twice. Considering their family members, they are more than a total of the total voters. In Korea, in most uh, special projects, the benefit cost ratio is around one. But basically, come if the first stage is given to the young person and the next to the small business owners and then and then is to the entire population, uh, the, the, the benefit cost ratio will be more than two. And the second strategy is uh, some difficult problems with me. Any society has problems that are very difficult to solve. Some of these problems can be solved by nature based income. This is a strategy that changed the way you look, we look at basic income. Uh, to persuade basic income, not as a goal, but as a means. There is a serious social problem. The problem must be solved. To solve the problem, basic income should be introduced. Those suffering from these problems will be in favor of introducing basic income. I will give three examples. Uh, one is fine dust problem. In Spain, the fine dust generated in China and domestic dust are mixed, causing serious problems. Parents who raise their children, as well as the elderly and the sick, are particularly sensitive to fine dust. The most effective policy is to impose a carbon tax or fine dust emission tax. But the biggest problem with carbon tax, however, uh, is people's resistance. The solution is to distribute the carbon tax revenue to people as basic income. In the case, over 60% of the households are net beneficial. So basic income carbon dividend is a means of overcoming tax resistance. The second problem is uh, real estate speculation. As you can see in the table, uh, uh, this is uh, the amount of on, on the income from land. So, land rent. More than 30% of the GDP, uh, the land rent uh, is about more than 30% of GDP. 
which they use. The most direct publisher of this great speculation is to import the red text, but the, the same problem and the same solution. Blend dividend is a name to so put. The last two example is the trilemma of national pension. Uh, increased pension, uh, we cannot achieve three goals at the same time without pension. Increased pension payments, stabilize pension finances, achieve intergenerational equality. In order to stabilize pension finance while increasing payments, Contributions must be increased. Doing so will benefit older people because they will receive higher pensions without contributions. But younger people will pay higher pensions for older people, thus breaking up intergenerational equality and increasing tax resistance. The introduction of DI can be a means of vis-a-vis this trial. If we reduce pension payments to less than the amount of basic income, while paying basic income based on basic income tax, total pension payments, including basic income, will increase and the pension finances will stabilize. Since the majority of young people receive more money than they pay, they will become a beneficiary of achieving intergenerational equality. This is a third example. Thank you. Okay, we now have uh, two discussants. I'm asking them to keep their remarks fairly brief so that we can have uh, a discussion from the floor as well. So if I'd like to start with Son Sonny Barton, uh, you'd like to come to the floor. Great. Um, uh, thanks very much for, uh, for inviting me. Pleasure to join you all. Uh, I've been asked to provide a perspective from a funder that has worked in the basic income space. I'll try to briefly cover three topics. First, what, what is a video network as the organization that I work for? Secondly, how and why do we become in, involved in basic income? And third, what, uh, what's next? What's, uh, what's for the future? So very brief background in the media network. Um, we started as an organization 15 years ago. We're a global philanthropic organization founded by Pam and Pierre Amidia. Pierre Amidia is the guy who founded eBay. Uh, we work across uh, several regions of the world uh, in topics such as financial inclusion, education, property rights, governance and citizen engagement, digital ID systems. And we have a, a flexible capital model, meaning we can both provide equity and debt um, investments into for-profit organizations and grants to non-profits. Uh, in general, we believe that philanthropic capital should be able to tolerate a significant amount of risk uh, in the pursuit of catalyzing social change. So secondly, turning to why, why did we get involved and how did we get involved in basic income? It, it actually started with cash transfers. We saw the literature, uh, the growing literature based on the positive, positive outcomes that related to cash transfers. And that led us to first starting here in India um, supporting JPAL, who were testing in from 2012 in both Bihar and then later in Rajasthan, uh, the effect of cash transfers in place of, uh, well, as an option against in kind benefits, the public distribution system that exists here in terms of food loans. Uh, that wasn't a UBI trial because that's a targeted system, but it was a launch point for us. Then later in 2016, we provided funding to Give Directly uh, in Kenya, and you've just heard uh, about that uh, uh, exciting and important trial. We wanted to be uh, involved uh, there, and I thought it was uh, very interesting because no long-term trial of that nature had been done where you could try to see long-term uh, effects and the type of behavior changes that would come when beneficiaries know that they would be receiving, um, receiving that type of income for over a decade. Then in 2017, uh, we provided a small amount of funding for a follow-up study on the Madhya Pradesh, India uh, uh, study that you've just heard about. Um, and this was to see if the effects lasted after the end of the uh, of the of, of the year of uh, uh, year of uh, transfers. Um, then, moving a little bit further, later in 2017, a new impetus arose for, for us as an organisation as to why to get involved in basic income and to continue looking at this. One of our new major areas of focus as a philanthropy is what we're calling uh, reimagining capitalism. 
we as an organization still strongly believe in the power of markets and of capitalism. We're not against capitalism, but don't support the current manifestation, the neoliberal version that's been poured to the US, to the UK, and several other countries for at least the last three or four decades. Um, our work at the moment in that space is primarily in, in the US and a little bit in the UK, uh, but that may evolve over time. Uh, in our view, uh, the neoliberal version of capitalism is flawed with views such as free markets above all else, the role of business as only being to maximize returns for shareholders, a diminished minimal role for government, and a, pri and a privileging of financial metrics such as profit and GDP over other things humans value. We think that this variant of capitalism has uh, contributed to some of the significant challenges we see in the US and elsewhere, including increasing inequality and insecurity, corporate concentration in many industries, and a general frame of the social contract. So it's with that in mind we've supported UBI trials. So we provided funding to the Economic Security Project in the US, um, starting in 2017 and 18. Um, this was to do surveys and analysis on the recipients of a regular income from the Alaska Permanent Fund, um, which has been providing a regular income since the 1980s. And so we wanted to see what the recipients felt about that. And then more recently, we've supported the Economic Security Project um, with the trial that's currently underway in Stockton, also uh, in the US. Um, then more recently, in 2018 and 19, we've worked in Scotland um, with the RSA, who have been doing some work uh, ahead of, uh, well, in conjunction with feasibility studies that are currently ongoing, uh, ahead of potential um, trials in, in Scotland. So finally, a look to the future, what's next? Uh, we're, we're very pleased to have been, uh, been able to support various UBI trials uh, in different locations, India, Kenya, the US, and the UK, and hope that this has some meaningful contribution to the field. We, we're also, we also encourage continued work into looking at how to pay. There's lots of options out there, and what will work will probably be very different country by country. Um, for Amidia Network ourselves, um, we've already put quite a lot of our limited resources into trials, uh, and we're keen to see how those pan out, but are not actively looking to do more trials, um, but we are very supportive of those who do, um, and the well-designed trials more generally. But I think, as some of uh, my colleagues have said, um, data and evidence, whilst important, will only get us so far. There are, there are questions here about morals and ethics, norms and narratives, which will need to be changed to be able to have the UBI and other bold um, bold policy experiments and other types of activity become implemented. Uh, so finally for us at the Media Network, we're looking at the broader picture of reimagining capitalism, for which um, welfare systems and UBI trials are one subcomponent. Um, however, we'll be working in many adjacent areas, we hope, in the coming years, and we'll be watching this space um, with, uh, with a lot of anticipation. Thank you. And finally, uh, Roberta Miller, oh, familiar to many of us, who's done such fantastic work, working on the organization of a previous Vian Congress. So I'd like you to give us a few remarks. Thanks. Hi, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me, for hearing some remarks. Uh, that just came to my mind when I was listening to these uh, great talks you gave. Um, well, first of all, I'm all in favor, basically, from experiments, and I think the question of the panel is excellent. Where do we, what do we do? Where do we go from here? Because for now, the evidence seems really positive. I mean, uh, we could, I mean, we as activists or uh, pe people that believe in the idea, we need first of all to be sure that it's a good idea. So this evidence is good for us. It's good for us as advocates to uh, convince political decision makers to apply the idea. It's even good for us as philosophers to engage in the debate because if we have empirical evidence, we can have stronger arguments against people who are against basic income. So it's extremely positive. But my first uh, type of uh, question or worries it's about the spinning of the results. Remember, I live in Portugal, and when the first uh, media communication about the results in Finland came, total this total failure in all of the newspapers in Portugal, the news, Finland experiment is a failure, 
evidence base is there to prove it, and I couldn't believe it. Then I read the news, and actually in the news, it just said that people don't work more. So for a basic income, it's pretty good, actually. But So the spinning is a real problem, even when the evidence is positive for people who believe in basic income. But imagine if the evidence is negative. Uh, I just received from a friend in Barcelona the first report on the evidence of the experiment in Barcelona. <laughs> and it's funny because they don't really know what to do with it because the evidence shows clearly that the part, the part of the recipients that receive conditional income, these people are happier than the ones who receive an unconditional income. So how do we spin these results? We activists, we have to be of course objective and we have to understand why they are happier because they're probably very poor people who never met, who never talked to persons and they have a more social life when they have conditional incomes, for example. But the spinning problem is huge for us. So this is something that I would like to ask the participants, how do they deal with it and the public? The second problem is about methodology. Um, so I would like to know if the people involved in experiments have uh, thought about having more inclusive experiments, meaning by this, where they can include the recipients in the design of the experiments. And uh, I thought that in Portugal I proposed a, a small experiment for funding. I, the response was negative. But my idea was to have this inclusive methodology because although it's not, it's difficult to harmonize this with scientific objectivity of the results, at the same time it's good for after the experiment ends because the people who were engaged in the design, they will probably keep feeling engaging about the consequences of the project after it ends. This is uh, another question I have. The third question is about when will we have an experiment that can include people who are already working? Because experiments in basic is not about uh, fighting poverty only. It's only also about real freedom in people who are already in a position, uh, of a, a comfortable position. So, what are the prospects for that? Can we go? How can we go into that, that direction? And finally, I think that this is an excellent panel. We should have many panels like this. But what about creating an institution, an organism? If maybe there is one, I don't know, which would gather all the information about all the experiments being done, where we can exchange methodologies, etc. And uh, finally, as an announcement, I am preparing with uh, Juliana Vita de Lure from. Uh, UBI lab uh, in Stanford University, a conference on basic income experiments in, for Lisbon next year in June. So you're all invited. We're still thinking about the program, etc. That's it. Thanks a lot. Oh, and this is the book I published in Portugal, where I defend the basic income experiment in Portugal. I just published this last July. It's in Portuguese, but we're fighting also for an experiment in Portugal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberto. Um, I've also been sent those results by our friends in Barcelona, and I I'd, I'd warned beforehand that their sample was far too small and sub and fragmented into eleven subsamples uh, with different designs, and the experiment was was classic case of trying to do too much with too little in terms of resources, but the, the, the people there are, are working on it. Before I, before I continue and open it up, then if I may take advantage of this, I'd like to uh, say on behalf of us all uh, a collective welcome to the vice governor of, of Gyeonggi province of South Korea. He is here and I, I've met him and several others of you met him and we'd like to pass on our, our collective greetings to him because he's been an important part of this fantastic uh, policy in his province. So if you could convey that from our, it would be welcome. Thank you. Um, I've been involved in, in many pilots and surveys. I was just reflecting on the fact that I've probably been involved in over 
50 uh, field projects in which big, big surveys have been conducted in developing countries mainly. And one of the things that I have a, a very strong feelings about is that too little time and effort and appreciation is devoted to the design of the questionnaires and the conceptual framework of pilots. A lot of attention is not given to whether it's a randomized control trial or is, is a proper sampling framework, and a lot of that quite correctly, quite correctly. But too little attention in relative terms is, is devoted to the questionnaire. And I've mentioned this to senior people in GIF directly, because I think it's a vital part. And if you're looking at something like basic income, you really need to spend a lot of time testing out questions that fit the particular context. And those of you who are understandably critical of pilots should appreciate the following remark, which I always start my training session, as Sumio may remember. The only thing you can be certain about is that we're going to make mistakes. I'm afraid that's the fact of all of the pilots that have been conducted. What is encouraging is the general sense of direction of, of the findings and the fact that they are dealing with low hanging fruit hypotheses. Do they, do they reduce labor? Do they uh, result in people having better health, less stress? They, they deal with those issues. They don't deal with the philosophical, ethical justification questions. We understand that. We understand that limitation. And with those three remarks, may I ask the floor for people who'd like to ask a few questions? Raul, and then you, and then I'm going to try and do alternate male, female. So please, women, please put your hands up uh, so I can keep to my self imposed rule. Raul. Uh, just a couple of thoughts in terms of humanistic uh, on pilots are uh, actually what we need to study because right now what we really need is to move on to implementation. So something that I've seen in a different context is do politicians who support basic income or getting implemented do they get re-elected? You know, that's a very specific question that we can actually look at, you know, across all these pilots or in Alaska or various places. Uh, and a separate question which is slightly different is there's a question of reciprocity that comes up and we usually point to the rich trust king and say that, you know, we're okay with them uh, getting lots of money for free. But is it possible to study people who are rich you know, who are rich heirs and what do they do? Or people who may have uh, retired uh, from Wall Street in their 30s and, you know, may not be super rich, but they say they have enough, a lot of them go and run restaurants and things like that. Uh, these are people who've got their own basic income and how do they spend their time? Uh, and sort of, but in general, I would suggest that if you look at basic income as something where marketing, we should go to a marketing research firm and get them to actually design a questionnaire about how can we get this across. Hi, uh, my name is Asaman. I'm uh, representing the NGO Sanction Tree at the University of Kota from Germany. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> we are um, conducting also an experiment on the minimum income. I would rather call it. The presentation is also tomorrow. And um, I first of all have a comment to my colleague Roberto. Um, speak up. Could you speak up? Sorry. Yes, I just wanted to uh, just add to what Roberto said that I think it's a wonderful idea as someone who's also involved with pilots and experiments, if we could actually connect with each other and kind of talk about the issue of methodology and study design. Um, our study lasts for the next three years, so um, I would love to talk about that with uh, everybody as well. And a question to Caroline, and you said that the experiment you were conducting um, was especially very relevant to the improvement of uh, women's situation. So if you could maybe elaborate on that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm from Australia where the uh, Andrew Yang effect is uh, virtually zero. 
Um, I'm wondering from each of you, from each of you uh, if there is such a thing as an Andrew Yang effect in your countries. Thank you. Hello, Anita Devsich from New Zealand. Um, I represent a women's organisation, we lobby. Um, I'm, I've been struck by the fact that it's mainly a community of academics here, highly um, educated, um, you know, and very senior, very clever people. And I applaud the work you've been doing. Um, BIN is new to me. And um, I'm very excited about it and the whole concept when I want to do some work in that area. But I just wonder, um, there doesn't appear, apart from the grassroots work that affects women, there doesn't appear to be a lot of input from women or women's organisations. I'd like some comments on that, whether it has been, or, but I would like to see if uh, that, that can be something that we can move forward with. Okay, I, I will ask my panel to respond to those questions they think they would like to respond to. Starting from Caroline. So just for coming here that I got the question right from Germany and you're asking what has been the situation of women out of the experiment that we're running in Kenya, was that right? Awesome. Um, I have come with me from Kenya, uh, one of our beneficiaries of the program, he is a gentleman, but tomorrow he has more time when he will delve onto the details of what has happened in his community. Um, just to give you a tidbit, we have seen tremendous, tremendous impact on women, particularly on empowerment. And um, I'll just give you a tidbit of one example. In the communities where we're working, Women are in environments where men are mainly the breadwinners. And if you're a breadwinner, it is for you to say, to decide, and to monitor success. So men look for money, bring it home, decide how it's used, and monitor if the women kept their word. What we have seen right now is a population of women who are now having an opportunity to sit with their men on the same table, discuss the expenses of the house, plan together, decide on what they save, including the man's income, not just basic income, how much the man will save, how much the woman will save, what they will spend their um, you know, um, cumulative income on for their houses. What that has done for women is basically it's expanded their decision-making capabilities, increased their visibility in their households, and given them power to even look for more resources because they see how emancipating and empowering it is just to be able to make a decision on the little money that they are receiving. So yes, there is so much that we can discuss. Tomorrow we invite you to a um, session with recipients where Dennis will be giving you more details about what he has seen in his community, and particularly for women and children. So, in terms of the inputs from women's organization, at least for the MP experiment, I can say that it was led by SEVA, which is actually a trade union of for women in the informal economy. Um, SEVA was instrumental in many respects. Uh, it led the experiment up front. Uh, it coordinated with UNICEF in terms of tra uh, transferring the money. It worked with its organizers on the ground to open accounts. And particularly, uh, as I said in, in my presentation, we made a difference between Seva and non-Seva villages. In the non-Seva villages, we facilitated the opening of the accounts, but in Seva villages, uh, they, uh, where uh, Seva had been working for some time, even before the experiment, uh, they were more instrumental in helping people, you know, so if I want to build a toilet, if I want to send my child to school, um, we also, for the women, we opened the bank accounts in the SEVA cooperative. And the difference is for the formal bank account, you have to go to uh, a, bit, you know, a, a considerable distance, whereas the cooperative is in your village. So you could actually withdraw and you could you know, do the saving in a much more nuanced. So, so the, the women were upfront. And I think the second uh, question in terms of inviting public debate, I think certainly we did invite uh, public debate initially. The chairman of the planning, the deputy chairman of the planning commission, at least, you know, at that time debusted the myths that you know alcohol, uh, there was no alcoholism uh, at that time on Take Sing Alwale. It was an important myth to be debunked. And then of course it was taken up by Arun Subramanian. 
And should the two politicians get re-elected round to your question? Interestingly, they never saw it as a state experiment. They said it's a saber experiment. So, uh, because, you know, that was the, the message that we got in the, because it is actually donor funded. So we, I don't think for the Indian experiment, we can say whether it had any implications on the political result. Thank you. Yeah, yeah sure. Just a comment on the Andrew Yang effect um, being in Canada. I think we do benefit from some of Andrew Yang's um, popularity. But I would say it's demographically specific. Like, basically anybody who's on Twitter and Reddit gets the Andrew Yang effect, and then I talk to my parents about it, and they're like, who's that? <laughs> so I think, um, yeah, I, I think there's some geographic spill over there, but I think your point is a good one, that um, champions go a long way. And I think that that's true, um, you know, of Elon Musk and of these other famous people who have at some point uttered the words basic income and we all attach to them and use them as uh, figureheads. And it's helpful in some ways. It's also difficult if, if people don't agree with their politics in other ways. So um, yeah, I, I look for champions that I align with and try to get them to speak louder because I think that is a good strategy, um, political or not. And, uh, political or not political champions, I mean. Um, about women, I, I think in Canada, a lot of the um, local group movement has been driven by uh, women's crisis organizations, certainly um, on the West Coast. And I think your point is valid, though, about the representation of people with lived experience of poverty and those who would benefit most directly, most immediately from a basic income um, not being as present in the conversation. And I think we should all commit to changing that. Before I hand to Ollie, let me add to that, that having been to New Zealand and participated in BIN's meeting, I know that women are playing a very prominent part in the New Zealand debate, so that that's good. And one, one response to you on the, the Yang thing, I, I think I've seen the same phenomenon in, in Britain. The fact that John MacDonald, the Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, has come out openly saying he favours basic income and he wants pilots. So I've noticed the effect. It's, the, it's in given backbone to a lot of other people to come out in favour who would have been keeping quiet. So I, I think those effects are real, real positive. Thank you. Uh, three reflections on the discussions here. The first one uh, it was. Uh, uh, it was the commentator who commented on, oh, it was Roberto, yes. Uh, you said something that they, they should include people who are working because in Berlin experiments that were run, you only have people who are unemployed or who are getting social benefits, social assistance, etc. Uh, it means that in those experiments we can uh, somehow study employment effects if basic income is good for enhancing employment in those groups. But we can study uh, what we call substitution effect. If those people who will get basic income and who are already uh, employed and working, if they do reduce the uh, employment and labor supply because they are getting some extra money, that's something that we can study uh, in those experiments that uh, now more are running, or at least most, most of them. Uh, I, once read a paper that uh, was based on an accidental experiment with basic income. It was a Swedish economist who had studied those Swedes who had won in lottery. And his result was that those winners, they reduced substantially the labor supply during the first years. But then that effect gradually evaporated, that it lasted something like 10 years, obviously as long as the money was in their pockets. And the second thing is uh, framing effect. Uh, I think that the proponents of basic income, they be as individuals and proponents uh, as political parties, they are very bad in selling the package. Uh, if the results are pretty good in our experiments or from our experiments, we can't sell them. And if I take a Example from Finland, 
when we re uh, released our data and results saying that people are happier and more satisfied when they are getting basic income. Then the spokesperson of the Conservative Party came out and there was a huge news in the tabloid, happiness on taxpayers' money. Then it was gone. So that the, it, it's a, I would say that it's a rocky road to the basic income if we can't win that framing battle. So that it's very, very important. And therefore, in the Finnish experiment, we are also studying media discourses, how media is writing about basic income, both in Finland and, and uh, abroad. Then finally, uh, the including recipients. I'm, I don't want to be crude, but uh, I don't know in which states uh, should we do that. Uh, should we do that uh, when we are modeling and using our micro simulations and evaluating who will win, who will lose, uh, what are the aggregational economic, economic consequences, what are the cons uh, distributional consequences, etc. Or uh, should we include them when we are writing the legislation on the experiment, or what is the proper phase to, to include them, perhaps? The, the evaluation, or when we are evaluating the design. So that I'm a little bit skeptical against that, but I can change my mind if you can convince me. Okay, are there any, any more questions that would be, yeah? Just a general question about, like, at this stage, what kind of lesson can we learn in terms of uh, design for a BI scheme implementation, like, that, that is valuable beyond contextual differences because some of you said uh, in Kenya, for example, or Finland, you used a uh, randomized control trial, and uh, in India, you avoided that because you didn't want resentment uh, with the community. So I, I was just wondering, like, considering you know what can be learned mutually from from different uh, experiments so far, is there any kind of general lesson that, that we can take away for future uh, pilot. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm also lucky to have been with Shanghai. Uh, this is a question uh, for Nam. Uh, I wanted to uh, uh, just say that I felt like I learned something more about the Korean youth dividend um, from your talk because uh, I was fortunate enough to be in, in Seoul for the um, Basic Input Expo, which was really Fantastic thousands of participants there in Gongi province to um, uh, uh, celebrate the launch of the youth dividend. Um, and uh, it's a truly amazing um, uh, design to have with this youth dividend that, that has built into it um, uh, the propensity for expansion because it goes only to 24 year olds. And as you say, they age out, but they've already had it, they have the experience of having had it. And um, you can just spread the word about it. And I, you know, the, the design feature of having it be funded by a um, local currency, uh, you know, meaning that this, the province was able to initiate it on its own without federal tax authority is really um, innovative. And then also, um, but what I learned today was the, the fact that the, uh, the business owners, where you can use the youth dividend, they're more conservative. And so it's a really smart way of building a coalition for basic income and for expansion of that youth dividend. Um, so that's a model that we should think about in other in other areas. The then you the the um, two other or three other uh, things that you mentioned in terms of carbon tax and dividend, land tax and dividend, etc. Those clearly would be things that would require the federal government to go along with them, wouldn't it? So I was just wondering if you could say a little bit about how far you are, whether you think that's a possibility that those two things might be implemented as well. Thank you, Roberto. You get over time. Uh, I'd like, I'd like the panel of those who would like to respond to these two questions. If we have a second microphone, we can have a last couple of questions. But would, would one of you like to respond to uh, why it's important? Yeah, thank you uh, for the question uh, uh, about the. Uh, the Jongi in Jongi province uh, surveyed recently uh, about the support rate of basic income, 200 basic income. One is basic income based on income tax, and the other is basic income based on land tax. But the support rate is higher for the land tax. So, uh, 
The region is, uh, I think, the big Korea, which is a very small country with uh, many populations, and the, the rent problem is very serious. So this one of the regions. And lastly, I would like, I am a really uh, uh, supporter, great supporter of uh, Mr. Andrew Yang. Uh, as you know, uh, Andrew Yang uh, publishes uh, three kinds of basic income. And one is freedom dividend, the other is carbon dividend, and the last one is democratic balance. I will talk about democratic balance today. Thank you. And on the design, actually, a uh, slight clarification, ours was also a randomized controlled trial, except we randomly selected the villages. We did not select the individuals within a village. Uh, so it was a slightly modified RCT design. But uh, I think Guy can tell you more. He has an appendix in his book about different designs. Yeah, on, on, on that, I, I, in the appendix of my book, basically, I summarize a set of recommendations on methodology, and, and to supplement what Samia has said, if you think about it, it's very easy to do a randomized control trial of individuals if you're testing a malaria pill. Okay, you can have a malaria pill, a placebo, a non-treatment, and you can randomize it. If you try that with a basic income in a village, you're going to run into a lot of trouble. Because if one neighbor has received it and another neighbor didn't get it, then very quickly they'll be knocking on the door, and probably more than that. It's a stupid idea, okay? But the, what we tried to do was we randomized the sample of villages and the sample of control villages. And it's a very important principle of any basic income pilot that the whole community should be recipients of the basic income because there are network effects, macro effects, that you don't get with an, an individualized random sample. So that's a very important uh, principle. But Oli has a couple of extra points. I, think. I, I just wanted to say that I, I think generally I prefer to fit my research methods to my research question rather than the other way around. So I think the right design depends on what your question is. And in um, the Ontario experiment that I spoke about, it was a randomized control trial. I didn't give many details about it that also included a saturation site and a different component for studying effects in indigenous communities, which I think is very important too. So. Uh, so if, uh, I totally agree with you with the problems of randomized uh, experiments and having them uh, carried out on an individual basis. And uh, the problem in the Western world is that if you have that kind of experiments at, as uh, you plan here in India, they will, they will be extremely expensive. If you take one community or oh, one municipality there and everybody is getting benefit, another one, another one, and then control municipalities, then it will be so costly that it's, uh, I think it would be impossible to carry out. So that therefore, uh, in the Western world, we do have, and for for example, therefore we had the pigment that uh, randomized, individualized, uh, nationwide right, uh, experiment. Then there was a question: What can we learn? Uh, the first learning is that context or contexts matter, and we have different problems in different countries, and the different research design in different countries try to solve different problems. For example, in the Phillies case, uh, we were wrestling with too high uh, effective marginal tax rates. And I suppose that they are not a problem in India or in Kenya. Uh, you have much more questions about the extreme poverty. And that poverty issue was not that much present in the Finnish design. So that, that, that's one. But uh, nevertheless, I think that we can uh, have some common grounds. And one is that the, what we have already spoken very much, or perhaps too much, the employment effect and work activity. We can look at in the same way in, in Kenya, in, in India, if it's good for employment. But the, I think that the most important things are to look at 
other dimensions like emancipation, em uh, empowerment, life satisfaction, self respect, confidence, future confidence in, in uh, self value or value of one being, and then giving future and future perspectives. That's very important. And then two more lessons. Uh, here you said that uh, we will make uh, mistakes, that's one. And then another is that we will make much more mistakes. On that, on that note, I'd like to conclude and thank the audience, thank all of you. Now, always the hardest session is post-lunch, particularly in a hot country, when it's the best of efforts to try to concentrate. So thank you very much for, for focusing. I don't think we've resolved many issues, but I hope we've raised a number of questions and those not familiar with the debates will feel that they've got some, some things to think about. And I, on that note, let me thank the panel, and we have a, a short break. How long is the break, Sarah? Ten minute break, uh, and then we resume for the, line, the last session of the day. Thank you very much.